Awesome. London, thanks for joining the show, man. Pleasure to be here. How's it going, Dylan? It's going really good, man. We're we're staying busy over here. And and as you know, with Texas, you know, my business partner owns Rain Tight General Contracting. So we are just covered up with water mitigation work right now. Right on. Yeah, the uh, the big Texas freeze, snow apocalypse has been affecting a lot of our clients. Um, got a lot of existing clients in a lot of trouble right now. We're trying to help out. So yep. you guys are feeling that. It's crazy, man. We walked uh, 30 units of a big multifamily property yesterday. Uh, 40 units roughly are destroyed. Uh, about 10 of them are complete guts. I mean, it's just crazy. And it's just the tip of the iceberg. So, but man, I'm really excited to have you on this show uh, because we met at SRC, got to talk a little bit. I was really impressed by some of the things that make you guys stand apart from other law firms. And then I got to learn more about you. Um, I got one of your awesome hats, which I have right here, which I wore last night to me casino Mexican restaurant. Um, so just really looking forward to having you on the show and you guys decided to become a, um, corporate sponsor for limitless. So we're just super excited about the synergy. We're excited to, to, to let people know about daily and black and excited to get into this show. We've got a lot of cool stuff. So before we do that, I want to share about our newest sponsor daily in black when insurance companies underpay delay or deny you need an 800 pound gorilla like daily in black on your side they fight to win and they have the record to back it up here's just a few key facts they've tried more cases than any of their competitors they help draft the texas insurance code and they testify in the house and the senate on your behalf to make sure laws are fair and balanced and when other law firms want to want to speak with experts they call daily and black so we at Limitless recommend one law firm to level the playing field for you against insurance companies. So if you need a fearless trial lawyer, you can just call Daily and Black at 833-574-5677, or you can go to their website at dailyblack.com. That's right. right. Now Thanks. that I've plugged you while you're sitting there, you <laughs> um, let's give people a little bit of background london how how did you get involved with daily and black and kind of share a little bit of your story getting into this industry sure so i needed a job out of law school um but before that uh you know we went to virginia military institute i grew up in virginia um my father was a navy seal uh when he got out the navy seals uh he was the land man, and we also did a lot of contracting work. So a lot of land excavation. Um, I grew up very blue collar. I uh, went to Nelson County High School, uh, public school. Um, it's one of the questions I ask of our young lawyers today, if they you know, work with us, did you go to public school? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, grew up very humble and uh, modest means in Virginia. Um, went to Virginia Military Institute. Uh, which actually stands for very miserable individual because that's what everybody is that ever goes to that place. I don't know how I got signed. It was free. Uh, that's why I went there, got a scholarship. Um, it was really, BMI was really good to me though. And I uh, found my way to UVA Law School after that. Didn't go very far. It was about an hour and a half away. Um, went there for three years, graduated. Needed a job out of law school um, and ended up finding uh, my way to work for a gentleman by the name of Andy Protoshiro and he uh, worked in insurance defense. So he was um, an insurance defense lawyer for 24 years before I began working for him. And when I started at his firm, uh, we had four clients, State Farm, Liberty Mutual, Nationwide and Allstate. And we represented those clients on a number of different defense matters. Um, but my background in contracting found my way to working in this area, property damage. Um, you know, interpreting exactimates. I was working directly with adjusters. You know, a lot of the things that go on behind the curtain, I was dealing with at that time for about four and a half years. Um, so I build hours. Um, you know, I, I ended up, you know, working my way up from representing all state to working up and, and working on state farm commercial cases. Um, found our way, you know, as far west as Texas and ran into daily and black, decided that I wanted to switch to the other side because what I was doing for the carriers was not enabling me to sleep well at night. Um, I've had, uh, you know, just as a example, I've had, you know, executives, the carriers, Tell me, you know, son, I'd rather pay you $50,000 to 
defend this case and lose, then ever pay that resident uh, or that you know residential insured fifty thousand dollars to settle this case. So it's difficult to. It was a good job. I mean, don't get me wrong. It was a good living. I liked uh, the you know working at that firm, um, but I didn't like our clients. And you know, the problem is when you only have four clients and you don't like them, you don't have a lot of options. And so the things that I learned on the defense side enabled me to then turn and go to the plaintiff side and give a, a different perspective. Um, you know, when I'm here, what contractors are dealing with with adjusters today, I'm thinking, well, what is going on behind the curtain that they might not know about? Um, and oftentimes, you know, my, my hypothesis about what might be going on is correct based off my experience. So I think, you know, it's, if you have an opportunity to work for the other side, I mean, you know, take it. Um, you know, a lot of people that were, you know, receivers in high school go on to play pro ball and they're, and they're cornerbacks, um, or vice versa. So, but, but it makes you a, a better skilled. And I, I think my favorite line of, you know, in the lawyering world is from Charles Dickens. And it says, he is no lawyer who does not see both sides. And so when I look at a case today, I'm looking at it from the defense perspective, not, uh, necessarily what are all our cause of actions, but how would you defend said cause of actions and oftentimes i'm able to decipher a course of action or a game plan if you will that's that's better than someone who, did, who maybe didn't have that perspective you know it's hard to say but um but our cases and you know the game plans we have been putting together have been doing pretty well so that was my background and how i arrived at daily and black um but you know it's daily and black's the top firm in texas at the time it's growing to be the top firm in the nation for property damage and other areas of the law, other areas of first party. Uh, we have life insurance cases as well, but um, my main area of, of expertise or, or what I focus on is large laws commercial claims. You know, I think that's just huge that it's it's part of your story and your experience that you were on the other side. And there's just no way somebody can match your level of skill and expertise and detail having not had that journey. So I think it's, I think it's interesting that you were on that side, you decided to switch and, uh, and now you're fighting for the other side. But <clears throat> when you do that, you already, you already have a behind the scenes look, you already know a lot of things that the average person just has no clue about much less just talking about the legal world. I mean, the gap in knowledge between somebody who's an attorney doing what you do day in and day out and the owner of a general contracting company is that gap in knowledge and skill set is vast. But then there's another gap there when you take somebody like you that that your clients were those carriers and now your clients, the owner of the, the GC firm or the roofing company. So I think that's huge. I mean, another one of our partners is Max Four Claims. And, you know, we, we we take a long time to pick a partner. The reason we landed on you guys is because I know some pretty powerful things about, you, you know, you guys have never lost a case. You guys like to go to you. You will take it to court. You'll take it to litigation. Uh, quickly, if necessary, you guys fight to win. Um, and same thing with Max Four. You know, part of their story is um, the guy that founded Max Four. He was a senior file examiner at a large insurance company, and they're That's a su- and they're a yeah. supplement company. So when you take somebody that literally trained hundreds and hundreds of desk adjusters on how to deny and delay. And now you you get him to switch sides. I mean, it's just a whole. So that's what you guys have going on. But but for for uh, for for contractors as an attorney. So so one of the things that stood out to me as I was getting to know you guys was uh, that you've never lost a trial. So that's that's huge. I mean, obviously, there must be some criteria that you guys use to say, okay, this is a good case to go after. or This is a case where we think the contractor really stands to win or, or, or something, but it can't right. just be that. I mean, you have to be very skilled, knowledgeable. Um, so speak to that. What, what do you think is the biggest reason you guys have never lost a trial? I think it's because our defendants are insurance companies, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I don't think it's because we're really the greatest lawyers, although, you know, we don't, no lawyer ever goes to trial with the intention of losing. Um, you know, have we gotten lucky? No. Or real trial lawyers, we, we deliver real results. Um, before I worked for Daily and Black, I've done a number of jury trials, um, bench trials, uh, lots of experience. Despite the fact that our some of our attorneys are, are younger, they have trial experience. Uh, John Black and Rick Daly have more trial experience than any plaintiff's attorneys I've ever met in Texas. 
and they're the best trial attorneys I've ever met in the whole country, uh, hands down. So, I mean, are we the, the best trial lawyers in the industry? Arguably, yes, but at the same time, our, our opponents are insurance companies. Um, and I'll just say this, I mean, in, in the personal injury realm, um, let's say you, you know, I, I hit you in the back and you sued me. And I had a, a state farm insurance that couldn't be mentioned at that trial or else it would be a mistrial because it would prejudice the jury to know that I have insurance in the, in the personal injury sense where you're suing me uh, personally. So that if, if you take that and then you expound upon that to know that, well, you can't hide that fact because the defendant is the insurance company with what we deal with. Um, I think that has a lot to do with it. And, you know, we're, we're, we always take jury trials. When you pull a jury of, of the insured's peers in a, in a storm uh, struck area uh, or, or an area that gets struck often, which, you know, our clients are usually right in the thick of it, um, that's, there's not a single person on that jury that hasn't maybe experienced some denial or underpayment uh, or some unreasonable conduct from an insurance company and trying to process their own claim or their family member's claim or their neighbor's claim. They, they, they know that insurance companies cheat people. Um, they know that that's a real fact. So, you know, when you consider though the fact that the defendant's the insurance company, that we always take a jury trial and then we have the best trial lawyers or at least trial lawyers with the best experience to go in and handle that case. I mean, every case is different, but, you know, we, we may lose one day. Um, you know, right now we're working on, com you know, commercial, large commercial projects. We may be remodeling bathrooms and redoing kitchens one day, but, you know, right now things are going well. Um, and we've got some, some good traction and we, you know, you're right. We haven't have, we're undefeated yet still, but, um, I'm willing to challenge the carrier on that any day. Yeah. And it's one of those things, you know, I put it in the description as I, as I sent an email out about this particular, this particular episode was that, um, it's not if, but when. You need to bring an attorney and especially obviously if it's a large loss claim, but even on some of the residential claims, I mean, we're doing a water mitigation deal right now in Heath, Texas, and it's a 9,000 square foot home. It's three stories. The entire house was destroyed because the sprinkler system froze, the pipes burst. <clears throat> well, if the carrier says, hell, we don't think the damage is that extensive, we've got a problem. I mean, the, the house is destroyed. The homeowner is going to be out of the house for at least nine months to a year. Um, so we're already thinking ahead about that. And then my friends, you know, when you get to, when you host a podcast, you get to make a lot of connections. And I've got a lot of friends in commercial roofing. I've got guys that fly all over, all over the nation that do large law stuff. And uh, I mean, they've got a handful of attorneys they rely on regularly. It's just a part of it and it sucks, but it's just over and over again that, uh, Insurance companies try to delay or, or deny things and underpay. And it's just it's just such a battle. But um, I love the fact that that you guys are there to fight that fight. And we're going to get into some specific things. And even as I got to talking to you, you know, when we, when we did our discovery call, I told you, I said, you know, let's address the elephant in the room. And that's attorney fees. So we're going to talk about attorney fees. We're going to talk about what what are some things that that um, people should gather on every claim, like uh, just specifics that the contractor should gather. We're going to talk about UPA. We're going to talk about when to bring an attorney in and stuff like that. So let's yeah. address the elephant in the room. You guys already have an impressive background. Um, when people do their research, uh, they're going to find that you guys stand out. So right away, it's like, well, that sounds expensive. So, so how do attorneys fees work? Let's clear the fog on attorneys fees for all the owners of roofing and GC companies listening to this. Sure. Yeah. So in the States we practice, our fees are paid by the insurance companies. That is a law. That is not the law in any other realm uh, other than in first party litigation, which is what we do. Um, so the fees are paid by the insurance companies. And then the question would be, well, if you're going to take my case and settle it, if that's the compensable uh, fee at trial, which is treble damages plus attorney's fees, uh, especially in Colorado and in Texas. Treble damages plus attorney's fees. That's our leverage going to court. And that's why we're able to settle the case for what our client needs. That is the contractual damages, the policy benefits that they're due, plus our attorney's fees. And so if, if we take a good case, if there's a good case and we assess it and we believe that there's a, a reasonable or there's no reasonable basis for the denial or the underpayment. I don't care what the situation is, whether they're relying upon exclusion, 
uh, prior damage, lack of maintenance, um, you know, faulty prior repair. Um, I don't care what it is. If the basis doesn't hold water, that's a good case. That's a case where we could convince a court or a jury that the benefits that we're asking for or that the, the policyholder was simply asking for before we got involved um, were unreasonably denied. That amount could be trebled or tripled by statute and then attorney's fees assessed on top of that. So when we look at that case, if that's a case we're willing to take to trial and argue that, that's a case the carrier should be willing to settle for the amount of the contractual damages, that's the policy benefits that are due or still outstanding, plus our fees. Because the alternative is an exponential number upon that. Um, and so you know, the question would be, nine times out of 10 I'm asked, well, then how do you settle the case? The answer is we have to settle it for an amount that makes you whole or gives you the policy benefits that you were due, plus our fees. If we settle it for 100% of what you're owed, then we would be doing you a disservice because attorney has to take a, a contingent fee. Some attorneys work hourly, we work completely contingent. No client ever receives a bill or an invoice from us. It's only the insurance company that pays our fees. Our clients put in writing, authorize exactly what they will agree to receive in settlement. So there's no dispute there. In addition to that amount, we have to go get attorney's fees. Because here's the here's the fact. If attorneys, not just daily and black, but the attorneys in this area, in this realm, do, do exactly that. They settle for what the carrier owes and then take a portion out of that, depriving the policyholder of the full benefits they were due, then they're giving the, the, the insurance companies overall a license to lowball. Because worst case scenario, they go through all the trouble of getting an attorney, maybe an appraiser, maybe a public adjuster. And then at the end of the day, the carrier owes 100% of what they should have paid from the very beginning. Oh, they'll roll the dice on that every day. So when we do get the case, which is probably less than 1% of the time that a policy order is actually denied, do we get the phone call, right? Or unreasonably denied, that is. Um, when we get that, if we settle those cases for only what is owed, then we're giving the carrier license slow ball. So we have to assess, is it unreasonably denied? And if so, can we take that case and settle it for what our insured, our client needs, what the roofing contractor needs to perform the work, plus our fees? And we do every time. And we're able to do that every time. And because we do a really great job assessing cases in the beginning, we're able to deliver that, that expectation of those results. But the problem is when attorneys go taking cases without assessing everything up front, and then they find out later that actually, I know you were looking for $1.2 million in policy benefits, but there's this policy exclusion that affects the code coverage at the time of loss. And it actually only provides you about 700,000 well, that could have been addressed at the beginning. So that's exactly what, what I do, what our partners do on the large loss field, assess the damages or, or, or what the potential uh, compensation would be in, in the trial situation before ever even taking on that case to, to create an expectation that's real. And so you guys must spend a lot of time doing preliminary research just to make sure that there's coverage where there needs to be coverage and that that you want to go forward and, and win. I mean, I, I imagine you you spend a fair amount of time researching and you, you, I mean, what, is there a percentage of where you have to go back and say, you know what, we know that you need to, you need to fight a battle here, but unfortunately there's coverage issues. Absolutely. All the time. Um, in fact, some of the better cases that I've been referred has been the result of turning down cases that were, you know, attempted to be sent to our firm at first um, and explaining why. But I won't just turn down the case. I'll, I'll tell the contractor or the insurer why um, or what the situation is and then try to provide another alternative for them to be made whole. I um, can't tell you how many times, you know, I've recommended, uh, you know, policyholder calls. It's not exactly ripe for, you know, an attorney to litigate the matter. And we refer it out to an appraiser or a public adjuster. Happens all the time. Um, so, you know, no, no claim. There's no one way to resolve every claim. Uh, there's no avenue of attack that's best over the other ones it's, it's really just particular to the scenario so i mean i act as a gatekeeper all the time to listen to you know what the grievance is 
what you know what the policy order thinks they're being a reason denied to try to match that up with what actually would come to fruition in, in, a, in a trial scenario and if that's supported by you know the evidence then we'll take that case absolutely that's awesome but you guys are you're contingency based you're going to get the insurance company to pay what's owed as far as scope of work damage etc and then right. you're including your fee on top of that and it's contingency based so you guys are really betting on yourselves at that point that's right. And I love that. I love that. I mean, that gets me excited. That's like, okay, the people that I'm partnering with so believe in their process and their skill and their ability to win this thing that they're not even going to ask me for payment unless we win. And that's uh, that's a powerful uh, testimony to the kind of work you guys do. Roofing contractors are the same way. They work on a contingent basis. You know, there's no promise uh, to be paid unless the job is done. Um, and that's that's exactly how we feel. You know, we're, we're on the same, in fact, you know, same way roofing companies have bifurcated, you know, their residential and commercial departments. We've done that at our firm. Um, and we operate our firm much the same way. A lot of roofing CEOs operate their, their business. Um, but it's, it's overhead and it's time and, and, um, and you know, the, the better cases that you take, the, the, the better we'll do. The better claims you take on, the better their overall revenues are going to be. But if they take on some claims that, you know, may not have all the things that they need to generate coverage, you can waste a lot of time and burn up a whole lot of overhead during that time. So, and we're not interested in that. Oh so yeah. We, right. We take a case. I mean, we were willing to take that to trial. That's great. Well, when, when you and I were discussing what to talk about, uh, you know, <clears throat> obviously attorney fees is a big one. And so we've cleared that up. Another one is you had mentioned to me there, there's really a few key things that should be gathered on every claim by, by whoever's running that job. And you mentioned a few things like data loss, peril, et cetera. So let's get into those. What are the, what are the three or four critical things that need to be gathered and, and why? Sure. So number one, and this is always missed, you have to have a covered peril. Okay. Um, covered meaning how do you know whether it's covered or not? You have to have a date because there's a policy, you know, foreseeably there's a policy that you know renews on an annual basis and you don't know whether it renews in july or january so what is your date you have to determine the date of and what is your peril so once you determine the date and the peril then you have a covered peril is it is it hail is it wind is it hail and or wind and then is it covered you have to determine that by a date of loss very simple but missed all the time um, I think, you know, every roofing contractor should have uh, access to you know, some sort of weather uh, reporting data and, and know the information on that property before they even engage with, you know, the client about a potential claim, right? Um, once, if you don't know, then you have to do some investigative work to figure that out. Maybe talk to the neighbors, but you, you, you can't tell them what their date of loss is, but you can present them with information and, and ask them if that helps them determine what the date of loss is and what the covered peril was. Um, next would be, you gotta get the policy. Once you know what your covered peril is, you gotta get the policy or a copy of the policy so you know what coverages are available there or your policy order does. Or if you're going into trouble, you can call a public adjuster or an attorney and have that policy available. There's so many times I get the call and they're discussing what coverages the carrier's offering and I need to, see the full policy to determine what's available and if they're being fair in that offer. So that's the next thing. Once you have a covered peril, you know what the data loss is. You need to ask the insurer to pull the policy. Usually they don't have it. It's usually a declarations page. You know, if it's under 30 pages, I can tell you that's not the full policy. Um, you have to get the full policy in effect at the time of that loss. So if it's two years ago, they call the agent, and they have to ask for last year's policy or the year before that. Um, or just specifically ask for the one in effect at that date so we can get the, co the coverages that are at issue or the exclusions that are at issue or the deductible that's at issue. You know what you're up against when you get the copy of the policy. Nine times out of 10, the insured has never seen a full copy of their policy, even if they've been insured for 20 years. They only ever receive a declarations page, which is just a summary cliff notes of what the policy is or what is changing in it, being added or taken away, and it doesn't tell you really anything. So. Get a copy of the policy, number two. Number three, 
So you have to do what I do, what I would call like the CSI effect, uh, some sort of crime scene investigation, but really this is a, this is a damage uh, scene investigation. So you have to do some sort of investigative work, um, oftentimes, like I said, to determine the data loss even, but if that's your data loss and you know, you're, you're in a position where you've reviewed it and found that you've taken photographs that this for placement is warranted, well, wouldn't it behoove uh, the roofing contractor to go and talk to the properties northeast, south, and west of that insured to find out if they received a roof replacement from that time? What was their date of loss? All that information is helpful. You know, there's no bit of, there's no question, bad question in that scenario. Ask to see if they've got pictures of the hail from the day. Ask to see if, uh, you know, uh, any of the cars outside got damaged by that. Um, do you have photographs of that? And, and be inquisitive um, to try and get as much information because the policy holder has it. Um, I was several years ago, I was in a, an insurance home and the issue was they were being denied because the hail that struck their property, uh, according to the carrier, was not large enough to damage the tile on their roof. And they specifically stated that, you know, anything over an inch and a half in diameter would have been sufficient. And that's the issue we're sitting there dealing with. And I'm sitting on the living room and we're talking about how can we, you know, asking the same questions. Do you have any evidence of the size of the hail? Do you have photographs? They had the ha hailstones two, two and a half plus inches in diameter in their freezer in the basement. Wow. They didn't think to pull them out until I asked, but they had the report. So you can't rely on the, you know, the policy. You have to ask the question. Uh, they might not have ever thought of that, but you have to show, demonstrate your investigative mindset on trying to gather the information you need to support their claim. Um, and then at the end, you need to estimate. You need to provide some sort of estimation for what actually you believe the work is going to cost. And I think a lot of roofing contractors pull punches or they, they try to hide that number because, you know, the insured, the concern is that they, that the insured is receives a call from the carrier saying, did you know your, your contractor is asking for $500,000 on this claim? And we're only offering $80,000 in coverage. And unless you want to be out of pocket, you know, suggest maybe you work with a preferred contractor. We have some that won't you know, challenge what we're willing to offer. And that's what happens all the time. And so it's because that I guarantee you there's not a roofing contractor that's listening to this right now that has not been burned in that situation. You know, whether it's legal or not, whether it's contractual infringement or not, it still happened to them and it's still a real concern, which is why they're afraid of submitting their, their full price. The answer to that is to have the policyholder submit your full price. Sit down with the policyholder because you get to sit down with them first and tell them what the number is versus the carrier calling them and saying, did you know about this number you were unaware of? and them telling them what they're willing to offer. So if the number is 500 and you have some idea that they're only going to offer 20% or less of that, you sit down with the policyholder and have them submit your estimate. The carrier calls back. Did you know that your contractor was issued an estimate for 500? Yes, I did because I sent it to you. That's what they'll say. And I also ask for you to please release all undisputed funds and give me a reasonable or give me a reasonable basis why you won't pay any line item in this estimate. So creating the estimate is key, submitting it for what you really believe the full value of the claim is, is key. And if the, if the policyholder has any question about that, you can sit down with them and ask them simply, do you ever plan on transferring ownership of this property, either during your life or after? The answer is yes. Do you think the buyer's inspector is going to find more or less issues with this property if we do this restoration job for less money? Very simple. Or policyholders that don't want to challenge that, uh, you know, let's say they do submit the estimate. The carrier comes back with 100 and your estimate's at 500. And they don't want to press the issue. They just want to, well, we'll just work with what we've got, right? Do you, I mean, how many times has it occurred where a policyholder thereafter has received a letter from the underwriting department that says, we've inspected, we've reviewed your property, and it looks like your roof is in disrepair due to impact damage. And... You need a new roof by the end of the policy period, or we're going to drop you. Or we'll offer you an opportunity to exclude the roof and double your coverage or double your premium and reduce your coverage. So that that's a real concern as well. 
Um, but those are all reasons why the estimate and having the policy or submit the estimate is key, in my opinion. Uh, there's some different opinions out there. There's some contractors that think they could submit an estimate for 80 and supplement it up to 500. I think that's asinine, but it's the way it's been done and it works in sometimes, so I can't argue with it, but I think there's a more effective way to do it overall, which is to put your price first. You wouldn't yeah. try to sell your truck by, you know, putting it out in the parking lot saying, make me an offer, would you? If you want $20,000 for your truck, wouldn't you put, you know, $20,000, $25,000 on it or, or at least 20 and say, and, and have some explanation as to why? That's how that's gonna go. Um, I think that's key. Document, investigate, estimate. Uh, that's the that's the last step, really. And I know it's a lot in one step, but if all that's done and the policy order submits your estimate, there's no need to do a mutual inspection. It might be beneficial to talk the adjuster into paying for it, but it's not necessary. The burden has been met by the policyholder. They've provided information of a covered peril. They've submitted it to the carrier. They've asked to release all undisputed funds or give me a reasonable basis. Why not? Your job is done. It's the carrier's opportunity to respond then. And if they don't respond within the time, you know, the time of the prompt pay act in that state, they're in trouble. That's so good. You know, we deal with it all the time at, uh, at rain tight general contracting. And we, we are a true general contract. We do a ton of roofing work, but we do GC work a fair amount of just your typical GC work. <clears throat> And uh, we just got a house for water mitigation last week. The homeowner has 80 year old wood flooring in his home that was custom milled per his specs, very expensive. And so there's all in, in addition to that, he's got this crazy, huge granite island in his kitchen that's that's been, you know, custom textured and all this stuff. And we're just immediately thinking, OK, not only do we have to tear the floors up, we're probably going to have to move the island. The island's probably the granite's probably going to get cracked or broken. Something's going to go wrong somewhere. I don't know what it is, right. but th but something's going to go wrong somewhere. So I'm kind of coaching the homeowner on that. But we're also coaching them on the insurance process. Right. And on on the battle that's about to ensue. And so I just got a text today. Hey, Dylan, um, uh, my uh, my agent told me I need to get three contractor bids. Uh, do I have to do that? And I said, OK, Mr. Homeowner, you're going to have to get three different bids from three different water mitigation companies, three different bids from cabinet makers, three different bids from countertop people, three different bids from sheetrock or, or yeah, she, people that will do sheetrock work, three different bids from painters. OK, so let's see, we're up to at least 20 different companies you're going to have to call. That's insane. Number one. And number two, you're not required to do so. Not in this state. You and I already have a contractual relationship. You've signed our agreement. What you need to do is respond and say, I'm already in a contractual agreement with rain tight general contracting. Here's my signed agreement. We've we decided to go with them. Conversation over. But right. it's just these games that th these games that they play. And I don't want to paint all all agents or carriers as bad because I, I do have some friends um, that, that are terrific agents and wonderful to work with. Uh, but um, unfortunately, on a lot of them and on this one in particular, we're already engaged in the battle, you know. Right. So having said that, based on what you just said about going into CSI mode and dealing with the carrier as a contractor or as the owner of the roofing company, how far can you go? Because we don't want to start getting into uh, into up at issues. So can you kind of clear the fog on that over the next couple of minutes? Yeah. Um, so I would just deal with it as an appraiser would deal with it. You deal with uh, facts only, uh, the damage in front of you only. Uh, you're not there to interpret coverage. You're not there to interpret when it occurred. Um, you're not there to interpret whether or not the damage that exists is covered. You're there to identify it, estimate it, do a little bit of investigative work to verify what you, the claim that the covered peril that you've identified is true uh, or, or substantiated. Um, but beyond that, no opinions ever need, need to be levied. Um, the fact is that the roof is damaged. You know, here are photographs of it. The fact is, this is how much it's going to cost to fix said damage. Here's an estimate representing that. Beyond that, the carrier's job is to create, you know, a coverage decision or make an opinion as to whether or not those facts warrant coverage. But it's not the 
roofing contractor's job to tell them why coverage should be extended. In fact, it's the opposite. It's the carrier's job to tell the roofing contractor and the insured why coverage won't be extended um, that's been requested, so long as it's been requested. And then the burden shifts to the carrier. Um, so as long as you toe the line between facts and opinions, the roofing contractor can never cross the line of unauthorized public adjusting. But the second they say the damage is clear here, here are photographs of it. The estimate is this, and I reviewed the policy, and in my opinion, you know, the coverage should lie here, or that exclusion should not apply. Now we're crossing that boundary. And and so, but but appraiser would never do that. I mean. And, and, and if appraiser was trying to do that, a roofing contractor would be probably justifiably upset because that's wrong. Appraisers are not there to do that. So if they operate under that same accord, they'll always be okay. Um, but the threat is there, right? The threat is there so much that roofing contractors aren't even willing to do that. They think, you know, for pounding an estimate and asking for, you know, a release of undisputed funds and to provide the reasonable basis why they won't pay it is somehow crossing the line, but it's not. It's simply a fact. And it's for the carrier to determine what their opinion, you know, on, as the coverage would be once those facts are presented. So that's how I try to explain it. Um, there's a lot of roofing contractors that get into trouble or situations where they're, and it's just because they're arguing. I mean, arguments are opinions. Um, but as, as they're just restating facts, you can't cross that line. So, I mean, my, my opinion overall is, is, is UPPA is total BS. Um, it's designed to try to deter, you know, contractors from doing the right thing and presenting the right information um, in the right order. But contractors, I mean, have gone astray of that. That's, that's a fact. I mean, there's evidence and examples where they actually have crossed that line. And that was, uh, you know, in fact, correct when they're advising, consulting, insurers and things of that nature. Um, you know, that's That realm is purely you know, the advising and consulting, uh, determining coverage is only able to be done by public adjusters and attorneys. Um, but, you know, insured also can, rep you know, can do their own job to read their policy and they can argue coverage with the, the carrier which is why you might want to have the copy of their policy in front of them. If they're a smart insured, I mean, you don't know if your insured's a doctor or a lawyer or somebody who's, you know, really going to want to read those 140 pages and dig into it. But if it's available, it's helpful. But but you can't do that. Uh, the contractor can't dig into that. It, it, I'm only asking for the contractor to request the policy so that it's available to determine coverage, not so that they can determine coverage themselves. No, that's good. So just stick to the facts, focus on the damage, focus on the scope of work and what it's going to cost. Um, and then, and then, and then let's say you do all that. And we all know that many times they come back and say, Oh no, it's, it's uh, they play games on the cost issues, which is just crazy to me. We were just talking at lunch today that an Xactimate at the time of the recording of this show, I think Xactimate has like a uh, $4 per, per uh, foot for Hardy board and, and uh, if you talk to any, if you talk to any siding guys, they're, they're saying, no, it's about $10 or whatever. And we had this long conversation at lunch about it and use that as an example. So Xactimate's terrible when it comes to up-to-date pricing, yeah. but, but let's say you do all the, all the stuff, right. You scope this job. Uh, let's say it's a commercial job, you know, insurance, insurance project. Um, they filed a claim. You've got your scope together and everything. When is a good time to pull you guys in? Because sometimes it, it gets a little confusing for the for the sure. contractor. Like, okay, should I use a PA? Should I put this, that, the other? When's a really good time to pull you guys into the situation? So there's never a wrong time to call. Um, you can always call. Uh, you know, and one thing that sets us apart at our firm is that you know we are real trial lawyers. We get real results. We're not interested in telling people what they want to hear. We might not tell you what you want to hear if you call, but we'll tell you the truth and we'll tell you what we really think. Um, and if we think at that point in time, uh, based off of sort of the chronology of the claim, if you will, um, that it's right for litigation, we'll tell you. 
if we think at that point in time that you know coverage decision hasn't been made and in fact the policy holder missed the date of loss hasn't provided proof of a proper covered peril we'll tell you and might recommend that you go by another avenue of resolving the claim uh visa visa appraisal or uh, a public adjuster and, and then maybe if that doesn't resolve the matter then to come back and to call us back um but it's it's hard to say you know at this point in time once you you know once one two three has been checked you know and you hit step four now every state's different there are prompt pay acts i think when you're being unreasonably delayed and denied obviously that's when you know you might want to make that call um but i could also say that there's not a one area avenue that that will work in every claim scenario um some of the most successful claims we've had at daily and black were uh, sent to a public adjuster at first then they referred uh and found found their way to us and then we hired a competent appraiser to appraise the loss and then go and fight over the damages later during the litigation so and, and who would have ever thought that that would be the chronology of experts that were used um i've seen cases go to an appraiser then go to an attorney um there's you know a lot of successful cases that use all three avenues of resolving that and, and it really depends on you know what's what's the appraisal provision look like uh you know what are the laws for public adjusters and attorneys in the state um and of course what are the particular facts of this claim um but i think when every contractor who's been doing this long enough has a like a spider sense if you will um when they're being unreasonable because they've gone through several claims obviously they wouldn't be in business if they hadn't handled a number of claims that went well where the carrier actually came out and did the right thing that's your baseline for when you know your senses start going off that they're doing the wrong thing you're probably right and you know i only get the call when they are doing the wrong thing but i can tell you i see specific fact patterns that are pretty identical regardless of what state they're in or, or what type of claim it is um and and they're bad faith practices and i think any contractor out there we could talk you know could probably have a whole separate episode about what kind of bad faith practices are out there and you know what to look for but i think the, you know those that are listening to this podcast know when something is awry when something doesn't smell right and when it doesn't smell right it's probably time to at least talk to somebody be it uh, an attorney public adjuster about what the potential is there and and a good attorney and public adjuster will give you their time for free give you the best advice whether it's to you know retain us now um granted you know, oftentimes you call a surgeon they're going to recommend surgery but we're not like that because i'm not trying to cut anybody that doesn't need to be cut and i don't we don't need to go down that road if, if, if there's a quicker or more expeditious way of resolving it because litigation takes time but it is a great way to preserve your rights and, and to ensure that you're compensated fairly because you have the right to settle for at least at our firm you have the right to settle and put in writing for what you agree to settle it for uh pre-authorized before that ever occurs so i think um the best thing i could recommend is to call earlier you know i get the call oftentimes and and, and the explanation is it's been nine months we, we completed a covered peril nine months ago the carrier has gone through you know three different engineers and consultants and given different opinions the one person i talked to that started you know getting in line with what we were saying went on sick leave even though i heard he was handling somebody else's claim yesterday um you know the type right i mean we all know what when that, i mean that's a great example of when your spider senses should be going off but that is also an example of bad faith practices they do that all the time you know they try to bewilder the contractor with a number of different consultants and engineers and um you know the the insured is intimidated by the stamp the engineer puts on it and makes them think they're dead in the water when coverage is you know at issue um and the contractor must be wrong because he doesn't have the credentials of all these people that they called in well before that happens when they start booking the you know the consultant engineer or that person goes on sick leave it's probably time to make the call um and we'll tell you where it's at and what's possible based off the state that it's in um but I, and I think a lot of attorneys would do that you know I'm, I would hope that attorneys aren't out here just saying, oh yeah you've got a case we'll sign you up no problem we'll take it on without ever really reviewing the facts and seeing if it's ripe to do that at that time right 
Right. Which gets everybody involved, can get everybody involved in trouble. So, so for guys listening to this to think, yeah, you know what? That'd be great. I'm convinced uh, daily and black sounds like a strong firm work on contingency. They'll take things to court. This is some powerful stuff here. They're thinking I'm busy juggling 20 different balls. I got a sales team of 10 guys. You know, we're trying to hit 20 million a year. We're getting into commercial stuff. I'm just drinking from the fire hose. I don't have time for this. Let's share a quick story about uh, a case you guys did. And the contractor didn't spend any time, hardly at all, talking to the insurance company. Yeah, so that, that contractor in particular is uh, 24 years old at the time. Um, Trevor Baker out of Roof Experts LLC owns his own company. Uh, first big commercial claim he landed upon, um, had a great rapport with the client. It was it was a Chubb policy um, and, you know, they, they provided the proof of their covered peril. He sent in his estimate um, for you know, what he believed it to be. And it was, it was a seven figure estimate. Carrier only came out and was willing to write an estimate for thirty thousand uh, dollars for a minor repair. When he then elevated it to have the insured send in his estimate with a request to release all undisputed funds or please provide a reasonable basis why you won't pay every line item of this estimate, they came out at an engineer firm come and inspect, and then told the insured that they needed to file a date of loss from a different covered peril because the damage over there that if you put two and two together with the minor repair they had already uh, adjusted for would warrant a full roof replacement well that damage over there occurred from a different date of loss now a carrier is in no position to be advising an insured what date of loss to file for the same way a contractor is not it's the ins it's the insured's burden to provide the proof of the covered peril and to determine what that is. They need to determine what the peril is and when it occurred. Once they've done that, the, the burden shifts and the carrier's job is to respond why they won't pay it. Now, if the answer is they won't pay it because there's this previous date of loss and that damage is not from the, da the covered peril that you're providing us, Mr. Insured, then, then that's the answer. But they should not be compelling the insured to file for a different date of loss, incur another $150,000 deductible and only to get a minor repair because what they were trying to do was bifurcate the claim. They have a hundred fifty thousand dollar deductible. They're going to write a thirty thousand dollar repair over here and a thirty thousand dollar repair over there. Even if they wrote a hundred and forty nine thousand dollar repair on each one, they still would have generated zero dollars on the claim. But overall, again, the full roof replacement on this commercial property was a seven figure claim. So because he had prepped the policyholder for that and because the pop when the when they responded with you know we sent an engineer out you need to file a different date of loss the policyholder had already submitted his estimate with that request i believe that's what prepped them to get mad you know uh, they were ready and waiting to hear a response and the response was you need to file another claim that, that didn't sit well with them and their spot, the insured spider senses were going off. And that's why they asked for counsel. Um, but I, I, it's hard to play Monday morning quarterback on it. I don't know if, but I, I believe I'd be willing to, to hypothesize that if the insured hadn't sent that in and the carrier responded to that, it would have been a different story. I, I don't know if the insured would have had the ammunition to get mad uh, or they just would have done what the carrier told them to do, which would have put them in a precarious position to where they never would have gotten the roof replacement that was eventually paid for. Now they denied the roof replacement. So the, the insured stuck by their guns and said, no, I'm not following it. This is my date of loss. I need you to issue a coverage decision on that. And then they stuck with a $30,000 repair. I think they tried to increase it, but it still didn't generate any, any value on the claim. That's when they hired us. We sent in uh, a 541 notice letter uh, demanding that they have 60 days to pay the amount that is requested in the estimate or else be sued and they settled it in 18 days oh man now that was their decision we can't force a carrier to settle in 18 days so don't think that's representation of the type of result we can get every time but i think the point of the story is when it was prepped properly the insured had met their burden and issued the estimate that they wanted them to pay provided that you know every and, and the insured tried to get that that 
covered peril off the track, basically, and they stuck by their guns, there was not much the carrier could do. Um, and so the contractor prepped them. They did that, and he never walked. The, he never had any. He did walk the roof with the insurance company. He did go up there with the engineers, but he never spoke to them. He never talked. He was just there to observe. He was just to fly on the wall the whole time. He let the insurer direct the communications to the carrier. And I think that's what helped get the job done. Um, you know, now he could have gone in there. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with talking to the carrier. I'm not trying to say that. I'm just saying, you know, it's an example of how he had no interaction with the carrier whatsoever. And that's what a lot of contractors, you know, think they have to do is they have to interact with the carrier to push them and tell them why they should pay for these, uh, you know, their claim, their estimate. But that's not so. Um, and so it's, it's, it's kind of a less is more idea, but it was effectual. And I think it's a great example for what contractors could do going forward, um, you know, with how they could handle claims and probably maximize the number of claims that they're able to um, provide, you know, a covered peril on without having to argue it so much. See, I like that story because as a business owner, you think to yourself, okay, I've got a decision here with this, this uh, potential job. Do I want to fight this? And and I need if the answer to that is going to be yes, I really need two things to happen. Number one, I need to know I can win, or, or it's highly probable I win. And number two, I know it's not going to suck too much time out of my life because this is not the only thing I have going on in my business. Right. And so for you guys, a big part of your criteria is making sure wow. you 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 it's highly likely that you'll win the battle. And number two, you guys are going to do all the heavy lifting. So. I think it's great. That's why we're excited to have you guys um, as as a partner and to send people your way. And so I think the last thing is how can people get in touch with you? Sure. Uh, call me on the cell phone. I'm always on the road. I'm either in the Denver office or the Houston office. I'm back and forth. Uh, but they can call me on my cell phone. That's 720-925-0785. I don't know if we could throw that on the screen in any way, but uh, 720-925-0785. 0785. You can call me anytime. That's awesome. Well, yeah, we'll put that in the show notes. And just so everybody listening to this, an attorney, uh, a very, a very effective attorney just gave out his number for free. <laughs> He's not going to be billing you when you call him. Nope. He's really there to help. So these guys are legit. I really enjoyed getting to know you guys at the SRC conference. And if I'm not mistaken, you're also moderating the legal panel at uh, Wind the Storm. That's right. Yep. Moder yep. Uh, I think we're giving another a speech on um, some interesting things. Daly and I are about to release what that speech is going to be on. So we've got some main stage president win the storm. Uh, we'll also be speaking next week at the blue collar American dream conference in Miami. Uh, so come check us out there. Uh, are you going to that, by the way, are you coming to that? You know, we are swamped right now with all this water mitigation stuff in Dallas. So we're, uh, yeah. yeah, we're, we're dealing with that. There's a lot of people that aren't going because of that reason. I have to go because I'm speaking there on Saturday, but you know, I'll be back in Texas as soon as I'm done. So, yep. Well, London, thank you so much for joining the show. And for those of you listening to this, I'll put his number in the show notes. You'll be able to catch this on our podcast and iTunes. You'll be able to see it on YouTube. And uh, of course, you can go to our Facebook group, the Limitless Roofing CEO Facebook group and see the entire video recording as well. So again, London, thank you so much for joining the show. I appreciate you, man. Take care. Talk to you soon, guys.